Hi, friends. This is Joe. This is uh, episode 141, I think, of the Decahedron RPG podcast. And today we are doing a uh, review. We are doing a review of Star Trek Adventure Gaming and the Final Frontier, which was the very first licensed Star Trek RPG. But beyond that, uh, we have a special guest today, and that guest is James. Hi, James. Hello, Joseph. Do you know what today is? I'm going to tell you because no, I do not. <laughs> because you're going to think today that the, the today the day that we're recording this, not today the day that we're releasing this. Today <laughs> is September 18th, which means the day after tomorrow is September 20th. And the reason that's significant is because our very first episode went live September 20th of 2022. So this is our two year anniversary. So yay us. <laughs> Surprise when we made it so long. <laughs> uh, yeah. And of course you were on the first show. You actually were on the first uh, dozen or so shows and uh, you were on last year's anniversary. And so it's only right that you're back here on this anniversary. And of course, I try to have you on really once a month. Um, but anyway, so welcome and happy anniversary to us. Oh, to many more years. To many more. All right. So uh, this is the second time we're trying to record this episode. Uh, well, actually, we did record it the first time. It just, there was no audio from my side. Oh, so that wasn't very useful. Um, although maybe that's the universe you're so, you're talk so, too much. <laughs> you're supposed to say take two. Take two. All right. Um, so let's uh, let's get into it. So, like I said, this book was the very first Star Trek RPG, you know, official licensed uh, RPG from uh, Paramount. Well, licensed from Paramount. It was published by Heritage Models. Uh, it's thirty-seven pages long, roughly. You know, do you count the index? Do you count the the little hex map at the end? You know, it's thirty-seven-ish pages. Uh, its author is Michael J. Scott. Although in other games, he goes by other names, but that's the name on the book. So that's the name I always use. Uh, it was published in 1978. Like I said, it was Heritage Models. No one's heard of Heritage Models these days, but Heritage Models back in the day was actually, well, they were a miniatures casting company. And when Dave Arneson uh, left slash was kicked out of TSR, um, Dave Arneson, for those that don't know, was like the creator of D&D. &D with help from Gary Gygax. Uh, yeah, I know. It's not quite like that. <laughs> That's another episode, right? That, that, could be, that could be many episodes. But Heritage Models is the company that eventually hired Dave Arneson. And this was one of the projects that he was supposed to oversee. And he had somebody in mind for it, one of his uh, Minnesota gamers. But um, it took Dave Arneson a long time to sign the contract. Again, a whole nother story. If you want to know more, read John Peterson's book, The Game Wizard's Scrape Book. Um, but anyway, so they need to press forward. So they hired this guy, Michael J. Scott. Um, like I said, he goes by other names in other games. Uh, and those games might be something called Space Patrol. So Space Patrol was a game published by Game Science, which was a company out of Biloxi, Mississippi. It was like the second science fiction RPG. Starfaring came first, then Space Patrol, then Traveler. Uh, although I don't know where Universe and Space Opera fit in there. So, but anyway, um, so yes, yeah, Space Patrol was one of the very earliest science fiction RPGs. And when Heritage needed to do something with the Star Trek license that they paid a lot of money for, they said, well, let's find somebody else. Uh, and they found Michael J. Scott, and pretty much all he did was he reskinned uh, Space Patrol and called it Star Trek. And then later on, Game Science updated Space Patrol, and they added a bunch of stuff. They called that Star Patrol, and then Game Science gave up on all that, and Michael Scott um, started his own company called Terra Nova Games, and he updated all of that to a game called Starfleet Voyages just to know where that this game fits into the history of everything. So what's in this book? This book contains character creation rules. It contains a combat system. It contains a very simple psionic system. It contains stats 
for uh, characters from the television shows from uh, Star Trek, the original series and Star Trek, the animated series. Yes, the animated series is considered canon uh, for this game, at least, because at the time it was published, that was all of Star Trek. Star Trek, the motion picture hadn't even been released yet. That was Star Trek. Um, it contains listings of stats and brief, like one-line descriptions of various uh, races and creatures from the Star Trek universe. Uh, contains a short listing of Star Trek equipment, and it contains two adventures. One is called the Shuttlecraft Crash, and the other is called the Slaver Ruins. What's not in the book? The book has no character uh, advancement rules. There's one line somewhere that says the GM might want to let them on occasion level up their hand-to-hand -hand factor. <laughs> uh, there's no rules for starship battles or the different types of starships. There's no rules for starship operations, like how does warp work? Not necessarily how does it work, but how much faster will warp four get you there than warp two or something like that. Um, yeah, nothing like that. There's uh, no rules for alien civilizations like Traveler did with like the planet creator and um, all that fun stuff that Traveler had. But like I said, this was published before Traveler, so they couldn't rip that off. But it does have a really neat alien maker. And I think that will pop up in a second. So the way the game works, it's attribute game. Uh, yeah, it's attribute based. So D and D that most people are familiar with, old D and D is class based. Newer D and D is kind of class and skill based. This has no classes, no skills. It just has your six attributes, and whenever you try to do anything, you just roll three d six, meet or roll under the attribute in question. Um, the only exception to the no skills thing is there is this thing called hand-to-hand -hand class or HH class, um, which is your combat ability. The game itself, I think when I look at it, it's just a reskin of Tunnels and Trolls. Um, when you look at Tunnels and Trolls, it has the same six attributes as D&D, except instead of wisdom, they have luck. This has exactly those six that TNT has, except instead of calling it intelligence or IQ, they call it mentality, but it's the same stat with a different name. Uh, in Tunnels and Trolls, you don't have hit points, you have constitution. When you get hit, those hits come off your, your constitution score. It works exactly the same in this game. Um, in Tunnels and Trolls, if you want to make a ranged attack, depending on the edition, that's one of the things that changes very wildly from uh, edition to edition in Tunnels and Trolls. But in the fourth edition, you would roll a D6 and look at the range, and that would just tell you if you hit or not. Well, actually, it was a matrix with your dex and your the range, and you just cross-reference. Uh, this uses exactly that system for range combat. For hand-to-hand -hand combat, it's 99% the same, except they made one major difference, which is in Tunnels and Trolls, you just roll your attack, your opponent rolls their attack, and you sub, well, actually, you're rolling your damage. You're both rolling your damage and subtract the one damage from the other. And that's how much hits the loser takes. In this game, there is an attack roll and a defense roll. And uh, then you swap you, and you still take the difference. So it's definitely um, inspired by Tunnels and Trolls, but it's different. And I actually think I might like this a little better than the raw Tunnels and Trolls one. Um, in Tunnels and Trolls, Monsters, most monsters are done very simplistically rather than coming up with full stats and descriptions and everything. It has one stat called the monster rating. This game, alien creatures have an ability rating or an AR. Um, same, same. <laughs> uh, in Tunnels and Trolls, uh, you have personal ads, which comes up a lot, which is a plus one for every po attribute point above 12 or minus one for every attribute point below nine um, and this uses those very same modifiers throughout the game so like i said pretty much they took tunnels and trolls and they rewrote it in space uh, the other interesting thing about this game is that it's divided into a basic game and an advanced game and they make a really big to do about it, but it's not really that difference. The differences are that in the advanced game, you roll up a character versus in the basic game, you just pick one of the existing ones like Kirk, Spock, McCoy, Sulu, 
I'm not going to name all the characters. Um, but yeah, you pick one of the existing ones and you play that. In the combat system, in the basic game, initiative is by dex order, which is exactly the same as the Holmes edition of uh, Dungeons & Dragons. In the advanced games, you roll for initiative, kind of like all the other versions of Dungeons & Dragons. In the basic game, all attacks do one die of damage. In the advanced games, it varies by your weapon, uh, much like Tunnels and Trolls. And finally, uh, in the basic games, there's only one psionic ability, which is kind of a cross between telepathy and mind control swooshed together into one thing. And in the advanced games, there are eight different psionic abilities, you know, like telepathy and um, mind control is a separate one, but like empathy and uh, telekinesis and all that fun stuff. Whew. All right. That was the the rush through of the game description. Uh, if this is your first time watching one of our episodes, the way we do game reviews is we talk about uh, the three things we like about the game, and then the three things we don't like about the game. And those are just personal, right? None of this is objective. This is the best game ever because of this or the worst game ever because of this. This is just what rubbed me personally or James personally the right way or the wrong way, uh, depending on the thing about the game. And because I've been doing a lot of talking, I'm going to let James go, for, uh, James go first. James, what is the first thing that you liked about this game? It was very easy to understand if you have played Dungeons & Dragons or Tunnels & Trolls for the year. So it wasn't a real time-consuming to relearn a new game. It was just a rip-off from other games <laughs> yeah i was gonna say uh we're again we're very early in the hobby at this point 1978 we're only four years after original D came out um i think we're like only three years after tunnels and trolls came out which really actually kicked off the rpg industry if you will uh right before tunnels and trolls it was just D when ken saint andre published tnt people were like hey we can publish our own games and uh yeah uh, so there, yeah, I agree with you. There's, <laughs> it is easy to understand because it just builds on what came before. Um, the flip side of that coin, I guess you could say it's not very innovative, but you know, innovation isn't always a great thing. Innovation for the sake of innovation, adding complexity just to be different. Yeah, I'll agree. I think that was a good thing. I, I agree with your assessment there. Um, my first good thing is the alien, uh, the random alien generator. It's, it's just this cool little thing. I might even do an episode where I roll up an alien from those tables. And uh, I, I thought it was neat rather than having a whole uh, monster listing or anything to have this set of tables where you can just create a creature. I, I liked it. <laughs> well, that was my number one, one. So what's your number two? Okay. <laughs> the fighting of it right, is um, very straightforward, very direct, and very easy. It isn't a lot of um dd over the years have got very complicated with parries and blocks and rebutes whatever you want to say all those back and forth a fight used to take uh let's say a minute and now it's 10 minutes later before you even get to the same spot <laughs> um the combat system. So like I said, this is based on the Tunnels and Trolls combat system. And also, like I said, I think their way of breaking it down to a attack and a defense role and then swipping, swipping, swapping, uh, might actually even be better than, than basic Tunnels and Trolls. Um, so yeah, I, I will agree. I, I like the combat system. It's a simple, it lets you resolve combat quickly and get on with the story. Uh, yeah, I agree with you completely on that one, sir. Yeah, my number two is the psionic system. Uh, I like psionic systems. I don't like crunchy, complex systems. This is as simple as it can get. I know for some people, they would probably say maybe it's too simple because um, it's pretty much like telekinesis. It says, you know, make your roll and it does it. There's no modifiers for like the weight of the object or anything like that. So by the book, you could probably say, I'm going to lift up that starship. But, you know, this is where the, the old school mantra of rulings over rules comes in. And uh, this embraces that. And this is a good framework for it. So, yeah, I like the psionic, yeah, psionic system. That was my number two. Okay. My number three 
it's a love hate type of thing. So it depends on who you're playing with. You get to play Kirk. I don't know if I love that or I hate that. <laughs> um. Yeah. Okay. I, I I have nothing to add to that. Yeah. I can see it causing problems where every. Although I think for most groups, everyone would want to play Spock, right? They would fight about. I want Spock. I want Spock. I want Spock. Um, although I'm more of a Kirk guy than a Spock guy, uh, but you know where I stand on non-humans. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I could see that being a problem. And um, if you were to mismatch them too much, like Spock versus Sulu, I mean, you know, Spock's the first officer, Sulu's the helmsman. Uh, but that's always a problem in any rank game. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, not, I'm, I'm... not just that. Are you going to have enough people to play the full crew? That's, well, you the the, the rest would just full crew. the rest would just be NBCs anyway, right? Just like right any other game. So that's that's no problem. Or you let everyone play multiple characters, that's no problem. Um, the only thing I will point out is that uh, you only play Kirk in the basic game. In the advanced game, you roll up your own character. My number three is the the pure love of Star Trek that's throughout this book. Michael Scott is clearly a Star Trek fan. Uh, from his introduction to his little things all along the way. Um, I mean, he has things in there. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a trucker. I love Star Trek. I mean, I don't dress up in uniform to go anywhere or anything. But, you know, I've seen never? every episode. You've never done it once? No, I don't own a Star Trek uniform. No, I, I had to think because I was like, for Halloween... <laughs> For for Halloween, maybe, but, you know, Halloween is, you're supposed to dress. I mean, Halloween, you can tell we're Halloween people, right? Do you see our little tree of skulls there? Um, (laughs) Right? Always dress up for Halloween, but I don't think I've ever done Star Trek for Halloween. Um, But, I mean, he has, there was one thing in there that even I had to look up, and I was like, is that a thing? But it turns out that it showed up in, uh, in a comic book. A Star Trek comic book that was out in the day, and I was like, "Yeah, okay, that's that's kind of cool. You're into it, dude." So, uh, yeah, I love that. That's a Star a Star Trek book should ooze with Star Trek love, and uh, this one does. And yeah, I really like that. I'm gonna throw something in there on that. All right. Um, there was one comment at the beginning of the book. Star Trek was a r- relatively short-lived series of television. I don't know if I'd agree that he was a, I, I will say he knew the Star Trek, maybe because he researched the material. I don't know if he was a real fan, like you're saying. Well, remember, this was written in 1978. Like the mm. first Star Trek motion picture hadn't even come out yet, never mind all the follow on series. At this point, all that existed were the first three years of the original series and the 20 ish episodes of Star Trek, the animated series. So, a three year series, and in fact, it was canceled after season two and then brought back for season three, if you remember. Um, yeah, that is a short lived mm-hmm. series compared to like Bonanza, which had like 10 years and okay. all those other big shows of the era right um so no at the time that he wrote that yeah at the time that he wrote Mm. that star trek was a relatively short-lived series (laughs) let's go to the bad list uh again the disclaimer nothing in this list is objective we're not saying this is a horrible game because of this well (laughs) we might but we're just saying that means it's horrible for us we're not saying that you're stupid if you think one of these things things is good or something different people are different this is just our opinion so james hit me with your first bad thing i've already started actually my bad thing was i could i just didn't feel star trek with the book it just didn't ooze it was there but it was more like a placement keeper for a game someone decided to let's create a game but i don't know what style, what genre was being created. That's my own opinion. See, I think the rules ooze with Star Trek. No, let me rephrase that. I think the book oozes with Star Trek love. 
I will agree that the rule set is not, there's nothing in the rules that says Trek, but I'm going to disagree because I'm not one of those people that feels that um, the rule set needs to support the, um, the world. I think they just need to not clash with each other. Um, I am perfectly happy with a very generic rule set like GURPS or Fudge or Fate or any of those and running whatever world on top of that. And I know that there's people that disagree. I'm not one of those. So anyway, yeah, my first thing I'm going to say is that, yeah, 1978, the Hollywood knew, I mean, if you ever read the original three books, the little round books of Dungeons and Dragons, they are a mess to understand. Um, and this continues that tradition because, man, this book just sucks. The way it's laid out, um, the way things are organized or rather not organized is just horrible. Uh, like I said earlier, there's that thing where for every attribute point above 12, you get a plus one, or every attribute point below nine, you get a negative one. Uh, that is repeated throughout the book, just like that, at least a dozen times, rather than just up front where you talk about attributes saying attribute modifiers. Uh, your strength modifier would be, you know, the same thing applies to all the others. No, it's every single place. Uh, but then other things, it's like how combat works. It's like when you're reading the advanced combat, you have to go back to the basic combat because it can't stand on its own and they're all jumbled up and it is not <laughs> it is not an easy read. Uh, yeah, that is my number one or three, depending on how we're counting, bad thing. Okay, so I'll go on to my number two. It seems, and it's my take of what I read through the book. I will say I've read it maybe twice in, from front to back, so I'm still missing some of it. It seems like the DM does a lot of the work instead of the players being very uh, active with it. Like I said, that may be my take on what I'm reading. Yeah, I, I think it is, um, but also that was an early style of play too, so you might be right. I didn't get that when I read it, but it just might be because I'm so in in tune with the the players do their part thing that, uh, yeah, I didn't see that. It might be there. I didn't get that feeling. I might have just ignored it because I'm like, who would do that? Or you just might be inserting it because, yeah, I don't know. My number two, <laughs> bad thing. <laughs> um and man, this, this rubs me the wrong way. There is no starship combat at all. Um, and to me, it is not Star Trek if you don't have a Romulan bird of prey firing on the Enterprise or a Klingon <laughs> D-9 cruiser engaging in threat. Um, there are no rules to do that at all. None. Nothing. Um, <laughs> and I, like I said, to Come me, on. that is not Star Trek. Oh, let's go on to my number three. And this could have been on my good list or bad list. I just don't know what was the best way to do it. Um, I'm not usually going for a short list of equipment and weapons. But for this game, I think it was appropriate. Would have I liked a longer list? Maybe. But I don't know if it would have helped the game. I'm going to agree with you completely, except I tend to favor the shorter lists. And Star Trek isn't supposed to be about the equipment. It's supposed to be about the people. Uh, and uh, although I did find it funny the way that they spelled Feinberger. Um, <laughs> so if you've ever watched Star Trek, like the original series, you know, like the little round thing they hold up and they scan something with we're using McCoy and he looks at his little medical tricorder as he does it. that's called the fine burger it was really a salt shaker that they found and <laughs> dressed up um but this prop master at star trek his name was feinberg <laughs> and so they named all these little things feinbergers and the spelling was just kind of unique uh for here but anyway um yeah my 
number one or number three, depending on how we're counting, bad thing about this game is that humans suck. Um, I go many episodes, I talk about how I really don't like non-humans in RPGs. I think too many players play them and they don't play them particularly well. And uh, it becomes about the abilities versus the character and all that stuff. And this game supports all that because you're, when you're making character, you roll 3d6 per attribute, you know, just like D&D. And as a human, that's it. If you look at any of the other races, um, they're all just left out of my mind. Uh, centurions, actually, I don't think they talk about centurions. Um, but uh, what's the ones that look like? Well, let's say Andorians and Vulcans and the ones that look like the orcs. What are their names? I can't remember, James. The the Wrong. pig faced ones. Yeah, it's not important. Uh, anyway. Oh, look at, I'm not gonna get it. If you look at all of them, they all have bonuses to attributes, and none of them have um subtractions. So if you're playing this game. It's to your detriment to play a human. There is no benefit at all to play a human versus any other race. If they had balanced it out, if they said, yeah, Vulcan, you get a plus two strength. Well, yeah, they do, and a plus two intelligence, but you lose a lot of charisma. That would make sense, but, but they don't. They just get the pluses. Nobody ever gets minuses, and humans get nothing. And so by being a human, you are effectively getting minuses because, yeah, I, that just rubs me the wrong way. Anyway, overall impressions. So, James, what are your overall thoughts about Star Trek Adventure Gaming and the Final Frontier? My thought is, it, to me, it would be a one-shot just because I want to play Kirk. <laughs> um, being a one-shot would make sense why there's no advancement rules. <laughs> Uh, and which character would you play if you had to choose? If I had to, I'd be Kirk, obviously. There's, uh, duh. <laughs> um, otherwise, I think McCoy that would be maybe? the fight with. Yeah, that's gonna that would be the fight with the party uh, with a group of people. I think you're gonna have to put all the names that I had, and you you pull out a name to which character you're playing. To be fair. Um, <laughs> I, I did like that the, that Lieutenant Mores was an option. So, uh, though she is non-human, but she is my favorite of the uh, of the animated series characters. Uh, so, anyway, thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm going to put thumbs down. I would not go out and buy it myself. Would I play it? Yes, one shot, maybe two at the most. All right, so that is your 2024 thought. If you could transport your mind back into 1978, uh, 1978, actually 1978, we had just started, right? So if you could transport your mind back to then, the year that we started playing games, what, I think what do I you think you would think of I it then? I'd be hard pressed to say that I wouldn't play it, but I think I'd still have been more D and D based because it had more variety, more more substance. That's the word I'm looking for. All right. Okay. So it sounds though then maybe back in 1978 you would have given it a sideways thumb. Yes. Okay. All right, so my overall thoughts, my overall thoughts, even though I said I felt that the rules don't need to support the setting, um, all the examples they give, because they give the two sample adventures and throughout, you know, it's peppered with uh, little examples of play like combat examples and stuff like that. Um, when they talk about making adventures and everything, they are playing D and D in Star Trek uniforms. <laughs> it's always on a planet. There's a whole paragraph about 
how to make sure that the transporter can't save them. The gameplay is Dungeons and Dragons. It's, you know, navigate through this maze looking for the dilithium crystals or navigate through this, <laughs> right? It, it's D&D with phasers and aliens. Um, <laughs> and then and now it makes sense why there's no starship combat rules and stuff like that. And I think that that's a big miss. They were so caught up with RPGs, our D and D, that instead of creating a Star Trek experience, they created a D and D experience with Star Trek trappings. Uh, and maybe that's what you were yeah. saying when uh, you were said it's not very Trekish. Um, in which case, I guess maybe I agree. Now, I think you could strip that away and you could play this very Trekish. Um, I'm not sure the 1978 me, but I was a lot younger than two, would have uh, thought to do that. Um, I, I've already talked about, I, I think the negatives outweigh the positives. I think for a gaming experience, if you wanted to play Star Trek, you would do just as well these days just to pick up your generic game of choice, you know, GURPS, Fate, Fudge, Rhesus, oh, Rhesus would rock, any generic game, and just make it up yourself. Thumb up, thumbs down. Um, I think for 1978, I would have given it a thumbs up, but there wasn't a lot of competition around back then. Uh, I definitely like this approach better than the fastest Star Trek, which is who got the license after this, because that's very crunchy mm -hmm. and rules heavy and all that stuff. Um, I think my favorite of the Star Trek games is the Last Unicorn Games Edition. But even then, I think, again, I would just pick up a generic RPG. Uh, I have an episode a few back, it's audio only. Maybe I'll update that one to have some video where I present a rule set that I would use for Star Trek. I called it Shirts and Skirts. Um, I, yeah. Um, so back then, I think I probably would have given it a thumbs up these days. Um, again, as a collector's item, I'll give it a thumbs up because it's, it's this neat little moment of gaming history, heritage game, I mean, heritage models and all that fun stuff. So as a collector's item, I also give it a thumbs up for playability these days. It is a sideways thumb. If I'm being generous, if I'm being disgenerous, it's a downwards thumb. So I, I don't regret having it as a collector's item. I don't regret reading through it. There was nothing in there where I said, actually, that's a lie. The combat system, I really want to try that combat system in a fantasy game um, for like a Tunnels and Trolls alternate combat system. So that, that, that was good. That's all I have to say. Do you have anything else, sir? No, it was a interesting read. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. And everybody else, thanks for listening. And for thanks for listening and following all that for two years. That's really great. I really super appreciate that. Uh, if you want to leave feedback, if you're watching on YouTube, of course, you can leave comments below. If you want to send an email, it's feedback at decahedron.com. You can you know, just include text or you want. You can even attach a voice file and I will play it. Uh, you can call our feedback line, which is 562-774-2278. That's 562-RPG-CAST. <laughs> or you can go to uh, sayhi.chat slash decahedron. And all those, remember, decahedron is spelled with a K. Uh, links are in the show notes or in the episode description down below. Thanks again for watching and or listening. <laughs> and until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Bye.